So, Paul. Yes. We have one of the world's most productive cosmologists in the house right now, and we've got questions for him. David Spurgle, are you ready for these? Yes. Absolutely. I I thought you were talking about me and being the most accomplished uh, cosmetologist. But anyway, okay. Forget yeah, yeah, cosmetologist. Uh, okay. Yes, cosmetologist. That's exactly what we were talking about. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, okay. Kyla Speakman uh, from Patreon. Kyla Speakman, don't have a location. I genuinely only have a Patreon to subscribe to you and one other, also space-related creator. Thank you for taking my question. In the ever-expanding universe, there seems to be a decrease in the amount of visible matter while an increase in dark matter, dark gravity. Could it be that as visible matter is pulled into black holes, dark matter is released via Hawking radiation? Also, when a black hole dies, what happens to said Hawking radiation? Mm. Okay, mm. lots of interesting questions there. So first, um, so the... The total amount of visible matter, or matter made of atoms, electrons, things, is about constant, but the volume of universe keeps growing bigger as the universe expands. So the the total number of atoms in the visible universe stays constant, but it gets bigger, so that dilutes it. So it's the density that's dropping. Wait, David, are, are we not losing? Are we not losing matter beyond our horizon uh, as it expands? out of you view know, it's still there we're not seeing it no it's still there okay fine and you know dark matter and atoms ordinary matter behave similarly they both can fall in black holes they but they're you know not that much falls into black holes it's a small fraction you know uh well below a percent um Dark energy, or sometimes called vacuum energy, on the other hand, is energy associated with empty space. So as the universe expands and there's more and more space, there's more and more vacuum energy. So when the universe was a billion years old, vacuum energy wasn't that important. Today, it's the dominant form of energy. It's about 70% of the energy density of the universe is in this energy associated with empty space today. In 10 billion years, it'll be like 90%. In 20 billion years, it'll be like 99%. So the dark matter and ordinary matter are just getting diluted as space expands and the vacuum energy becomes more important. So Paul, what he just said is, we're all gonna die. <laughs> well, we're all going to die regardless of whether the universe is expanding. You're probably not going to notice the expansion of the universe that much for another billion years. But, you know, we're, you're probably not going to make a billion, Neil. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Damn. I've been taking uh, good care of myself. I'm eating right. Wear, wear a seatbelt. You wear a seatbelt. Man, you ruin everything, David. I'll tell you. All right. Yeah, okay. Now, the Hawking radiation is um, actually... Uh, for black massive black holes, Hawking radiation is a very small effect. It will take trillions and trillions of years for the sort of black holes that we detect to produce a significant amount of Hawking radiation. And the Hawking radiation is mostly in the form of radiation, not matter. Right, Paul, give me another. Sure. Richard Hart here from Elk Grove, California. I've seen a lot of news recently regarding tired light. What exactly is it and how does it impact the way we view the age of the universe? Mm. So the idea behind tired light, and it's not an idea that seems consistent with the universe as we observe it, is that as light travels to us, it loses energy. So the red shifting effect that we're seeing as we look at distant galaxies, is not due to the expansion of the universe, but of light losing energy as it travels. In in the tired light hypothesis. Yeah. In the tired light hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Now, right now we have many different ways of testing the expanding universe model. The expanding universe model says the universe, um, distant objects not only should be redshifted, they should have lower surface brightness, uh, Time itself gets stretched. So when we look at a supernova explosion, for example, when we look at one nearby, it takes 50 days for the supernova to drop in brightness by factor two. But because time gets stretched the same way light gets stretched, 
What we observe is if we look at a distant one, when the universe is half its present size, it takes 100 days. Even more distant one, it takes 150 days. So we're not seeing just time light getting redshifted, we're seeing time getting stretched, we're seeing the behavior of the stretching of space. And as we look further back in time, we look at the microwave background, we see that the universe was much hotter. And we can test our uh, expanding universe model in multiple ways. So for example, we can predict the density of atoms from the properties of what we see in the microwave background, how sound waves behave in the early universe. We could also predict the density of atoms from the amount of deuterium produced in the first three minutes of the Big Bang. Both those techniques predict it with an uncertainty of only a few percent. And they agree remarkably well. And we have many, many tests like that that test the consistency of the expanding universe model. So we're not entirely reliant on one interpretation of the redshift. Now we've got right. mm -hmm. many cross checks on it. So mm -hmm. we can measure the temperature of the microwave background by seeing how it affects um, gas clouds at high redshift. And we can see at redshift one, when the universe was half its present size, the temperature was double. And at redshift three, it was four times as high. So we can test this in many different ways and get a consistent picture consistent with a universe that's 13.8 billion years old. In other words, Paul, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> it's too. It's well, it's funny because I thought David was. It just sounded like he was winging it. He was very, he, he was very vague. He had no specifics. I'm like, this guy's just what? Up. No, yeah. no, but so. Wait, so, David, was was there some recent paper about? So there was a recent uh, paper claiming a much older age for the universe, mm -hmm. based on an analysis of colors of galaxies, mm -hmm. uh, and. That analysis um, rested on a lot of questionable assumptions. <laughs> so, so, Paul, that's a scientist's way of saying he was Florence. <laughs> dog poop. That's the science said. It's dog poop. <laughs> hey, Neil. Happy Sweet 16. What? You, this is your 16th book coming out, the one that we started working on oh, together two oh. years ago. This? <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, it's my 16th book. Practically forgot about because I've been very busy, and I guess it's coming out in a month. Well, it's my yeah. first book, so... Oh, sorry. We oh, gotta do me. something. Sorry. So I should be more excited that... Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> I may be biased, but I think this is your best one yet. <laughs> you know, so, but, but is it, is it, but is it still intri intriguing, or... Are you uniquely implicating this relative to other papers that even you've written? Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I, I, Can I get the I, person's name? Can we get the author? No. <laughs> I think they were uh, very quick to issue press releases that emphasized an interpretation that was uh, questionable. Right. But why would so you I, do? Why would you do that, knowing that you're going to get called on it? I mean, they they got to know that there are people out there like the two of you and me who could call them on this. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, right? some, people, some people think there's no such thing as bad press. Yeah. Right. Um, right. No, look, we are seeing in the James Webb data, uh, when we look at the early galaxies, things we don't understand. These are these galaxies that were in the Dark Ages? These are galaxies emerge as we emerge from the Dark Ages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Um, these are galaxies that turn out to be often uh, brighter than many people expected. Um, my own interpretation is the first generation of stars were primarily very massive stars. That, you know, the first stars were not stars like our sun, but stars 10, 50 times the mass of our sun, um, more like some of the brightest stars we see in the night sky. And that would confound a traditional interpretation of where those galaxies, of what those galaxies are doing, as as found by James yeah. Webb. Okay. So I think people start very reasonably by assuming that the stars in a distant galaxy have the same distribution of very massive stars and stars like the sun as our galaxy. But I 
Um, and then if you start with that assumption, you reach some surprising conclusions. And my feeling is the right thing to do is question that assumption. And there probably are just uh, primarily supermassive stars forming at high redshift. Paul, David is no fun at a party. You know, you try to put out yeah. a cool idea and then he just rationalizes it away, you yeah. know. Well, it's like you're standing there and it's like, this is great punch. And David's like, is it? And then he just... <laughs> I'm not the vodka cranberry mix is uh, questionable. Um, you say it's you you say it's kettle one vodka. I say it's uh, Smirnoff. Uh, I, kind I of... think you know. How do you know they didn't? Uh, you know, a lot of bars keep the good <laughs> bottles and they right. fill it with the cheap stuff. Oh. There you go. Oh. There and, you go. And then they still put it on the top shelf. Right. If exactly. I'm going to go buy a car, I'm taking David with me. I am taking <laughs> David with me. He's my guy. Uh, let's slip in one more question. One more question. David Robertson. Good day from Albury, Australia. Mm -hmm. Down under. David, has anyone found anomalies in the cosmic microwave background radiation? I'm told it's basically the same in any direction. The stuff we can see in one direction can't see the stuff we can see in the opposite direction. We can't be in the middle. We are not that special. Well, okay. How much larger is our universe? Speak for yourself. Right. Exactly. It's like someone wasn't hugged as a child. Uh, <laughs> we love you, David. We love, uh, uh, David Robertson. We love you. Okay. We can't. We can't be in the middle. We are not. Uh, we're not that special. How much larger is our universe, or is it just a really weird shape? So there's a lot of interesting questions there. Um, it appears that the universe is large and very uniform. We can have tried to measure the shape or effectively the size of the universe. And all we can say at this point is we have a lower bound that the size of the universe, the size if you went in one direction and you would come back on yourself. So imagine going around a donut where you come around back to where you started. Um, that size of the donut, if that's the shape of the universe, must be larger than what we could see. So it's at least 26 billion light years across. So we don't know whether the universe is infinite or finite, but if it's finite, is it is really big. So we live in a big universe. And we live, as David noted, in a universe that's nearly uniform. And we see the same pattern of fluctuations roughly in the different directions. And the fluctuations don't seem to have anomalies. They seem to be drawn from kind of a bell curve distribution that we call a Gaussian. Um, and it, it, the statistical properties of the fluctuations are incredibly simple. So we detected at this point millions of independent points of fluctuations. And the universe turns out to be so simple that I can describe the properties of those fluctuations by two numbers, the amplitude of the fluctuations and how they vary with scale. And that completely characterizes it. So it's a. So that means you're not finding interesting, weird things deep buried in the cosmic microwave background. Weren't there some people who were looking for that to see lots if, of people, if there lots was like a, 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 a parallel universe bumping into it, whether one, one direction was the mirror image of it in another direction? So people look for those colli uh, collisions of other universes. They looked for like, are there high peaks? In fact, I was one of the people who did this, right? Are there high peaks? Are the fluctuations, are the valleys different from the hills? And it just, every time we look for something, uh, <laughs> the universe just disappoints us and just stays simple and <laughs> isn't revealing its are you, are you still looking for like, there's a, suppose a signal that, for a brief period after the there was a like a fast expansion of the universe right after the big bang is that fast, still something yeah so this is an idea of a theory called inflation that predicts this really rapid expansion it ex helps explain why the universe can look so similar on two different sides um and it predicts the pattern of temperature fluctuations we see so it's been successful and just to be clear david correct me if i'm wrong the temperature of the universe in one direction in the early universe compared with a whole other direction is more uniform than the temperature variation in the room I'm sitting in. 
Uh, depends on the room, but almost certainly. <laughs> That's right. Unless you're in a special room. Yeah. Yes, he's in a special hermetically sealed room. No, that, I got an uh, air conditioner over there. Oh, it's then blowing you got air cold air over there. Right. If you got air conditioning on, you're, it's definitely bigger fluctuations in the microwave right. background. Right. Yeah, okay. so no, the fluctuations are, are tiny. And to give it a sense of what we are trying to do as astronomers is this inflation theory, this period of very rapid expansion, predicts that there should be these very long wavelength gravitational waves that were produced in the Big Bang during this period of inflation. We haven't detected them yet, but they predict a very distinctive signal in the pattern of polarization. Mm. And as okay. we speak, we're, I just got some pictures last night of uh, our site in Chile, where we're building a radio telescope 17,000 feet above sea level. And it's optimized to look for these signals because we want to test this idea of inflation and see if we can find uh, the gravitational wave signal. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, why, don't you just use, why don't you just use an app on your phone to get it, David? What do you need a 17,000? <laughs> oh, my God. You guys we, just like to spend money, don't you? All right. We got, okay. we got to end it there. But we have a zillion <laughs> cosmology question. David, we'll have to bring you back. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pleasure. and uh, possibly even sometime. when you finally submit the report uh, to Congress or to NASA for your studies in UAP. Uh, but thank you for your leadership there. And it's been a delight and an honor and a privilege to count you as my friend and colleague over these many decades that we've been working. Always a pleasure talking. Yeah, yeah. Paul, all right, dude. Uh, good to have you there. Thanks. All right, this has been a, a quick cosmic queries on the cosmology of this universe with david spurgle and my co-host there is paul mccurio as always keep looking up